Welcome to another episode of Artistry, where art meets industry. We are your hosts, Rochelle Etienne Robinson and Stan Substantial Robinson. Peace, everyone, and Peace. welcome to another episode of Artistry, where art meets industry. I, we are your hosts, Rochelle Etienne Robinson, and this guy over here, Stan Substantial Robinson. Today, mm-hmm. we are so excited, as we are every day, but today's guest is a dear friend. She's an interdisciplinary artist. Her work consists of installations where she incorporates sculpture, uh, sound, and performance. Uh, She has lectured and exhibited extensively at MoMA, PS1 in New York, the Contemporary Art Museum in Houston, Texas, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, the African American Museum in Philadelphia, and the Institute of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles. She's also an associate professor at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and most recently, the recipient of the United States Artist Fellowship. Please welcome Maria Gaspar. Hi, everyone. Hi. Thank you for having me. Thanks. It's such an honor to be part of your program. Thank, uh, you. thank you. For thank you so thank much. Thank you for joining us. Yes, yeah. absolutely. So we want to get started because I, as all of us have, you know, this past year has been enlightening, heartbreaking, challenging, and any other type of adjective you would like to add. How are you <laughs> and how has your this last year been for you? Mm. Um, yeah, it's it's certainly been a uh, uh, a challenging, um, but also affirmative year. I feel like um, you know I'm a I'm a new parent of a of a toddler, um, and you know managing being an artist, being a teacher, and being a parent was particularly difficult. Uh, this it still continues to be <laughs> difficult, um, as as you know, one cares for one's family, but also extended family, right? Um, uh, and also having children that are not you know able to get vaccinated yet, you know, they're still kind of a vulnerable population. So I'm constantly, you know. Uh, worried um, for my child's safety and just trying to find spaces to thrive and to feel um, joy, you know, amidst this time. Um, I have also, I've been working at a a place of detention the last 10 years and due to COVID, I have been unable to uh, go into the jail to continue my work um, uh, given, you know, COVID. So that has also kind of change things for me. I'm now developing a new project that works on the outside. I can tell you more about that later. Um, So my practice has changed a bit. And one of the questions that I've been thinking about a lot is how does one sustain a socially engaged practice or community-based practice uh, during social distancing, Um, which is really challenging because often we're working so intimately with others, but when we can't work intimately uh, due to the pandemic, it becomes particularly difficult. Um, uh, so, you know, that's that's one end of things. But I also use the word, you know, affirmed. And, you know, given, um, I think, the conversation around, you know, state violence and um, given the conversations that, that people have brought, brought up around abolition or we've been talking about abolition, but I think it's become much more uh, common uh, within the U.S. I think there's uh, this affirmation that at least I feel that 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 is the direction we need to go in, and that um, I'm thinking a lot about what steps I can take within my practice or within my own being to work towards that. So that that feels affirming, even though it has been particularly difficult, you know, the last year and a half, especially for more vulnerable communities. So um, there's a lot on my mind, you know. There's a lot to um that is still unfolding for me right now yeah you know we're gonna talk of course we're gonna delve a lot more into that um regarding your practice but i want us to take us back in time um you were born and raised in a a town called little village neighborhood in chicago in chicago's west side what was Mm -hmm. life like growing up um on the west side of uh, chicago in the 80s and 90s yeah um you know chicago is uh such a um vital city you know it's historically it's the um 
it's sort of the foundation for a very strong kind of civil rights history. It's also has an, an incredible cultural history of the mural movement and um, DIY artist spaces, um, you know, cultural spaces that were, per, you know, uh, developed or um, founded by teachers and artists and just independent people. So it has such a rich history. Um, so growing up in Chicago uh, was profoundly, you know, important to my practice because it it really taught me early on the importance of art, but also um, to have a care for one's community. You know, I, I I didn't see them as inseparable; they were always together. And I think um, even though my neighborhood at the time didn't have a lot of arts and culture in that 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 area. Uh, the area next to my community had some incredible resources that I was able to tap into. Um, so, but I, you know, I think I, I saw the um, the kind of uh, life, um, the, the sort of livingness of a community through entrepreneurship, through small businesses. Um, we didn't have a lot of arts and culture, but we had a lot of um, festivals or kind of public celebrations. And I think that kind of gave me an appreciation for what it meant to be a first generation Mexican American in Chicago and to sort of see various generations of that culture um, emerge as uh, a kind of um, different forms of leadership in, in the city. So that was exciting to see. But it, you know, it had its challenges. It was also, it has been, um, you know, one of the 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 most sort of gang, uh, it, you know, areas of Chicago that that really struggle with gang violence. Um, you know, we have I, f I forget the percentage, but a, a, you know, very high percentage of young people who are unemployed. Um, you know, Cook County Jail is is at the center of the community of you know, eighty thousand residents and the jail um, you know, had at, at the top about 13,000 people incarcerated in, in that you know, compound. So there's, there's a lot of um, you know, struggles that I think emerge when one thinks about the social landscape, that the social landscape is made up not only of, of what's there in front of our eyes, but also the psychic, the emotional, um, the way that carceral space shows up in different ways, you know, um, through surveillance and, and other forms of um, state violence, like immigrant detention, being threatened by ICE and things like that. Yeah. Um, so com complex, beautiful, hard, soft. Um, and uh, my mom, you know, has been a really important um, kind of mentor for me. And I maybe not mentor, but <laughs> um, I'm not sure she would. I mean, I mean, she's my mother, of course, oh, in some ways, but I think that um, she wouldn't call herself a mentor, but, it, you know, she, for me, really modeled this uh, love for community through her teaching and, and through her own professional uh, work when she was a radio DJ and when she did clowning or she did, she sort of took up all these wacky, wonderful artistic things on the side. She had a lot of side hustles <laughs> um, and I was able to like partake in some of those side hustles and, and so, you know, it was always through the spirit of like joy and fun and love, tenderness mixed in with the hard and the difficult, you know, and um, I feel like I'm trying to, in my artwork, trying to also tap into all of those things, you know, the complexity of an experience. You mentioned that your mom was a, was a clown, which I love. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what was your first introduction into the arts, whether it was Dan? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was probably it was definitely through my my mother because she started uh, doing radio. Um, she had her own programs on a small like boys and girls radio station two blocks from our house, and it was managed by my uncle and my other uncle also had a program. So it was very kind of family. Um, uh, it was very much a family affair, and um, she had a, a program about. Latina women's health, mm -hmm. for example. But then she also had this show um, about poetry where she would just read poetry in Spanish, which I hated because I was about four years old maybe. And I would um, I, I would always have to go with her to the program. And it was in the evening, I think. Um, and I would sit in the waiting room listening to her voice. And she had a very sexy voice, mm -hmm. you know, for the poetry, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
it so disturbed me. Mortified. I was like, oh no, <laughs> hear my mother speak sexy. You know, that was, um, did not like that. I did not like those voices, but I, I, I got, I think it helped me listen to be a, a better listener mm -hmm. because I noticed the nuances of her voice, you know, when, when she felt more confident or when she felt less confident or she was nervous or when she, you know, her mistake, I loved her mistakes, you know, um, I don't know why, because, um, uh, I, I guess because I got to see her work through something and I enjoyed seeing her kind of like want to be better. And she did a lot of um, voice training in the car. So we would, you know, drive to the station or, or drive wherever. And then she would just train um, vocal little exercises in the car. So that that was that was a really fun experience to, to just that was unusual. Right. That was just really unusual to see. So it's definitely definitely my mom. Um, and then murals, you know, I'd say it was murals, just seeing lots of murals in the neighborhood and, you know, some uh, murals done by, you know, uh, so-called professional artists, but also, you know, people who were untrained, but, you know, really good at what they're doing. Yeah. Shout out to your mom. I just want to say that, you know, um, when you mentioned um, Cook County, um, uh, the, the prison in the area where you are, um, so Marcus D and I, um, shout out to Marcus D, we were on tour some years ago um, in Chicago. And we actually, mm -hmm. um, Cook County um, uh, Correctional for the for the younger. Um, oh, younger. okay. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, and one of the things I thought about where you were talking, you know, because a lot of times when we see when we see these young brothers, it's like, of course, we know uh, we have an idea of how they ended up there. Right. But it's just when you hear the ages, it's just like trying to make mm -hmm. sense. But when I hear your story, right, and I hear all of the different things that your mom, you know, thankfully was able to expose you to and how mm, important yeah. that is, because it helps you visualize, like, you know, I'm sure seeing her do so many different things also help you realize that maybe mm -hmm. you almost anything you wanted to do, really, right? Right. And so, um, and just remembering when I was speaking to those young brothers, uh, because I was mostly talking to them about music, but also visual mm. art as well. And mm -hmm. I remember a young brother saying, like, I didn't even know you can make money from art. And mm -hmm. like, that was just heartbreaking, mm -hmm. right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, because if he had the right resources, the right, mm -hmm. money, like, he likely would not be there, right? And so, um, yeah. but shout out to your mom, you know, that's awesome. That's super yeah. Awesome. And yeah. Mom. Yeah. No, I, I love that point you're making about, um, you know, having the tools or the resources to even, you know, even sort of get permission to imagine or to yeah. reimagine something. Absolutely. I, I, in my experience too, uh, I've, I've had people I worked with at the jail tell me a similar thing. Um, uh, I remember uh, we were doing this project together. I was working with about 12 incarcerated men mostly. And, and, uh, I showed them the work of Doris Salcedo, who's this, you know, really amazing artist from Colombia, who's who makes work about um, state violence. But it's so it's so um, it's so embedded in materiality, like it's really lush. You know, she works with dry roses and other very potent materials, which she stitches, and they were just blown away. I remember, uh, you know, a comment was like, you know. I didn't know you can make art with, you know, with those materials, with, with old shoes. I didn't know you can make art with chairs, you know, and, uh, and, and there was, there was these, you know, beautiful realizations about what's possible. Um, and I think that's why art is so vital, you know, even if one doesn't necessarily want to pursue a career, but that creativity and, and art making and all of that is such a important part of our, uh, as, as, you know, Audre Lorde would say, it's, it's, um, Poetry is not a luxury, you know, it, it's the it's the, the vital essence of our lives. And so, yeah, I totally yeah. agree. You know, um, of course, you, you studied um, art throughout school, went to a, um, a specialized high school that had a very strong art program, which landed mm -hmm. you at Pratt Institute, where we all met. Um, yeah. Tell yeah. us about your experience at Pratt <laughs> and, um, and what did you study at Pratt? Yeah, I studied painting, <laughs> but I, 
I, I feel like um, I had, you know, but I guess maybe we, or maybe everyone has a complicated relationship to painting. You know, it's such an old traditional form. Um, I, I knew this question would come up and, and um, I, I feel so grateful that I, to me, the best part of that experience was meeting people like you. Um, it was the the friendships and the community that we made because what what is kind of amazing about that time, at least for my, maybe for my selective memory, mm -hmm. is what I remember the most uh, were spirit ciphers. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. going to going to um, see Stan at perform somewhere, right? Rochelle's managing of the student union and all the programming that happened there. I mean, boom, 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 you know, it was like well-organized um, uh, situation there. Um, and, you know, bringing Slick Rick, I remember, some, yeah. I don't know who that was. Somebody brought Slick Rick to perform, um, you know, uh, Origination, the yeah. black organization where, you know, there, there was no Latinx organization at that time. So there were a lot of, Latinx people that were part of it, but also a lot of black identifying Latinx people uh, yeah. that were also part of it. So, you know, that was such a beautiful, special space. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, soon after that, um, I helped start Alianza, which was a Latino organization. And so to me, all of that organizing work yeah. was maybe the most important part of that experience. And I think in some ways, I mean, I think a lot about that time that maybe it was a it was a response to um, there being a lack of of representation within the curriculum. You know, mm -hmm. like my painting department did only talked about Clement Greenberg. Wow. You know, <laughs> um, uh, you know. Luckily, I, I eventually met people who um, faculty who then uh, kind of had a more diverse, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, curriculum and 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 you know yeah did did a lot of amazing stuff um but it, to me it was all of that um the adjacent the adjacent mm -hmm. education that happened with being at pratt and it, you know it was being in that neighborhood at that time yeah. 1998 being there during 9 11 you know like it was just there was so much um yeah it was so much mm -hmm. it was great times indeed mm -hmm. um you know after graduation, you know, and of course, after your studies, um, you have exhibited, you know, through, you've participated in group um, exhibits, solo shows, murals. Take us back to your first solo exhibition. Was it Oblation of a Parade? Was that your first one? Your first solo? Yeah, yeah I would say that that was probably the, one of the most significant shows um, because it was at a major museum. You know, I, I, I had a you know, I guess that would be it. Yeah. Yeah. That was in 2009. So that was immediately after. Um, no, that's actually not true. Maybe my, my first solo show was at a, another, um, uh, it was at a smaller artist run gallery, mm -hmm. which was, which was a really beautiful experience too. Um, but the MCA show was significant because, yeah, it was you know the first museum show. Uh, at the time, the curator was really um, supportive. Uh, you know, she's still supportive, but she's no longer at the museum. But she's you know she was very supportive of of my work, um, and I was able to experiment a bit. So I showed this um, piece. I, I had made a smaller version of the sculpture. Um, where I was looking at public celebrations, particularly at like. Um, cultural celebrations and the way that uh, people communicate affirmations of one's, you know, culture, right? So I was looking at kind of this mix between, you know, Mexican and American culture, the kind of representations of that. Uh, but I was also really s deep into studying brownness and I was mm -hmm. making a bunch of work about, um, I was, I did this series called Brownouts. I started developing the series called Disappearance Suits shortly after where it was about opacity and you know brown kind of connecting brownness to uh identity um uh what so when um jose esteban muñoz's book came out um about brownness which was you know earlier this year i was like oh my god this is this is exactly you know um feeling of 
of brown, right? And and thinking about brownness as this um, uh, as this this sort of uh, space of both. It's like trauma and joy of um, or of potential. You know, it's like this this mix mixture of of things um, that's non monolithic. And um, so anyway, so that show was really important. I also collaborated. Um, with a bunch of performers. I was also beginning to do a lot of performance work mm -hmm. at that time. And um, I was working on a mural um, at this organization that um, uh, it, in, in my neighborhood that, that, you know, was really kind of revolutionary. They uh, had this history of talking about, you know, uh, safe sex during the HIV AIDS crisis. Mm -hmm. um, and we're doing really incredible work in a, you know, first, second generation Mexican community of mostly Catholics, you know, and they were passing out condoms when I was a kid and, you know, doing things like that, that were really like controversial, you know, at that time. And um, I, I did a mural for them that same year and, and I invited some of the young people I was working with to perform with me. And they were, you know, queer, um, um, identifying young, young people, people who were just, interested and open to, to trying something new. And so it was this Tracy Pollard, who's um, a good friend of ours who went to Pratt, um, who, you know, she was dancing a ton, right? Also kind of professionally around this, as, at the same time doing her design work. She flew in, she also performed as part of it. So it was this really beautiful group of all different kinds of people uh, who performed and, and they performed as this collective brown body that moved through the museum space, kind of creating uh, what I thought of as a kind of um, brown space. Mm -hmm. um, and the performance took place during uh, the museum sort of first Fridays event, which was basically mm -hmm. like a club, you know, it was like the museum turned club. Um, and so they they really demarcated space, really occupied space with their bodies, and people had to move around them. So that was all very intentional, and, and it was um, it was a yeah, it was a great space to test out some of these ideas I was beginning to kind of you know uh, develop. That's awesome, you know. Um, your work has, you know, has obviously evolved and has developed over the years. Um, so much so that, you, like you said, you've incorporated performance, you incorporate mm -hmm. sculpture. Um, in 2012, you created a site responsive art project that involved the community. Much of your work does include, you know, stakeholders and of the, mm -hmm. of the community, where it was called 96 Acres Project, which you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about that. How did that all come, come about? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I, um, that same, I think the year before, um, I, so I've been doing a lot of, I was doing a lot of murals and that's what I was, I was, you know, working as an independent artist, mostly through contractual work. Um, I didn't have any full-time work at the time, which is what I chose. And, and I was, you know, teach, being a teaching artist in different CPS schools, all, Chicago public schools all over the city. I was also doing murals in the summer mostly mm -hmm. um, and working with mostly young people. Um, but I was beginning to feel like I needed to grow and um, I wanted to really merge my performance interests uh, and find a way to, to talk about public space through the body, not just through a surface. Um, I was putting pigment or glass because I was doing a lot of mosaics at the time onto a surface, but I wanted to talk about the wall itself. You know, I want to talk about how walls um, in, especially in this case with, with the jail acts as a, you know, dividing line as a border. Um, so I, I did a project called City of Sight and um, it was, you know, with the NEA and I was able to get, um, a partnership with the local community organization that was not arts focused, but was very interested in the arts. Um, and they they partnered and we hired 15 young people from the black and Latinx side of this dividing line um, in, in the neighborhood because La Villita is also called South Lawndale. Mm -hmm. You know, as, as you can see, like many cities that, that, that have a history of redlining and other kinds of racist practices, like um, around you know, um, uh, kind of uh, the way the way wards or other kinds of infrastructures are organized in this, in cities. Um, Chicago uh, has 
uh, ways of separating people that are embedded in infrastructure. So, you know, the train line divides the Chinese community from the black community or the viaducts separate the black from the Latinx and uh, all kinds of things. So I wanted to really think of ways to talk about um, about the division, but also about um, the common space, you know, the, the way that a high school parking lot is a stage, um, the, uh, the uh, you know, the um, via potentials of public space. And so I'm, I'm telling you that because that was such an important experience. I and mean, it was sort of life changing because, you know, when I when I was doing it, I was like, man, this is exactly what I want to be doing. Like, this is this is this is the direction I want to go in. OK, mm -hmm. so it felt really good. Um, and difficult and all that good stuff, but it felt really good. And so um, one of the things that we were talking about was how the, the jail, you know, as we were walking around the neighborhood, just looking at space, um, we talked about how the largest architecture of our neighborhood is a jail. And what does that mean? You know, like it's, it's not, you know, that beautiful library or um, that community garden, you know, it's, 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 it's a jail. And so then we, um, so, so yeah, so that planted the seed for me in my mind. And then uh, that same community organization um, who I've been just collaborating with for many years was, uh, was interested in developing something. So just little by little, we started um, uh, inviting artists, community folks to meetings that just talk about what would it look like um, to create a public work or series of public works at and around this, this jail. And, you know, th there were very, very vast, vastly different um, responses. You know, some people wanted to beautify the wall. Some people wanted to put a Band-Aid over it and just sort of um, put it away, you know, and others wanted to talk about incarceration, mass incarceration, mm -hmm. because they were system impacted or they themselves had been incarcerated. They, they understood um, how, how the system um, is, is tied to, you know, larger systems of oppression. And so there, there were a lot of, you know, different conversations. And this is, you know, 2012, where maybe conversations around mass incarceration were not as common within, you know, the larger community. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of people were learning, including myself, you know, learning about how the system works, uh, learning about what it means to be, to go through that system. And then, um, Eventually, that led to creating this project that um, was an independent artist project where we produced eight site responsive public projects using theater, sound, performance, uh, installation between 2012 and 2016. And um, some of those projects were collaborations with uh, organizations. Um, we worked one year with a group of women who were formerly incarcerated, and some of them had been at this jail on, just on the other side of the wall, who led a series of workshops outside of the uh, of the jail around Augusto Boal, the Theater of the Oppressed Exercises. And it's, it, was, it was really quite powerful to see um, these women sort of use their bodies in, in, in creating images that really worked against these narratives that we have about who is incarcerated, you know, often powerless, you know, dehumanized, you know, all of these things. Um, uh, in another project, um, we worked with uh, another community group of young people where we produced stencils out of plexiglass and then they used a power washer to remove the dirt from the sidewalk to then reveal the the text so the text included things like what's your role you know um what do do you see me and th this was all like stuff that the young people came up with so i kind of acted as um you know, I mean, I acted as a community-based artist, so working with young people, working with different groups, and then working with the alderman's office, the Cook County commissioners, the sheriff's department to get approval to do all of this, because obviously we couldn't just like, we couldn't do a guerrilla style. Um, we would, of course, you know, either get arrested or be <laughs> thrown out. Um, so this this was a very, um, uh, you know, um, delicate process of balancing all these different stakeholders within the community. Well, you know, I saw an interview with you where you talked about how when you were younger, when you were um, a little girl, as you went to a field trip to, uh, yes. to the prison. And I, I just know. thought, wow, you know, most people, I don't know, go to the museum. 
<laughs> we go to a farm. <laughs> well, we're, gonna, right. we're gonna assign heading some. zoo. Heading zoo. Yeah. Heading zoo. yeah. No, we're gonna go to right. you guys to Cook County Jail. And unlike you know, with a lot of urban environments, you know, mm. it's not like you know, like we see in TV where prisons and and jails are right. in the off skirts of town or in the rural area. Yeah. This was right in the smack dab in the middle mm. of the community. Mm-hmm. So it's a mm-hmm. constant reminder. Constantly yes. people know, like, yes. this could be you. Or you yeah. Know. yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think that trip was meant. I mean, we were about twelve years old, and I and I, again, I was I was trying to. Sometimes, you know, in, in one's memory, we remember things differently. And so, I, I recently, maybe two years ago, I, I contacted some of my classmates from from my Catholic school. And uh, was asking them to recall that that event, and they all sent me um, memories that they had, including eating a bologna sandwich or something that they provided, um, uh, getting scolded for crossing our legs. Um, uh, I remember um, the guards explaining hygiene to us, which was very, I mean, very strange. But we were we were walked through the oldest part of the jail, which is Division One, which is actually currently being demolished right now as we speak. Um, and we and there were men, young men, older men, young men locked up. They were in those cages, and we walked through those walkways. Um, and, uh, I, what I remember the most was, was really thinking that the men that were in there looked like people I knew. They looked like my brother who was, um, maybe at the time was probably around 20, almost 30 years old, you know? Um, and, uh, I also remember my mostly white teachers being really scared, um, just really scared running through, you know, I, it, it, it was very confusing. I mean, I didn't know there was no... I mean, it was clearly a scared straight tactic. Right. I don't remember if they like gave our parents something to sign. I mean, I don't know what ha- what went down, um, and my parents will not remember probably. But I, I I think back to that moment a lot, and I've gone through there several times, right? Because I I've taught there, and I've also organized my own tours there, inviting community members to come to see um, because it's different. I Maybe mean, sometimes if you haven't been in there, granted, some people have, and it's triggering to go in there, of course, for them. Um, but I think if more people understood what it actually looks like and how it, uh, how that system behaves, mm-hmm. we would have a different um, perspective on how we deal with um, harm. Yeah. and what other alternatives there could be to dealing with harm. Um, so in some ways, I think, well, the teachers or the school thought it would keep us away from the jail. It sort of did the opposite for me, but from a different perspective, right? Yeah. That I, I, I want to work with that community and I, I want to continue working um, to, to, to do these projects that I feel have been, at least for me, very transformative and um, important, you know. Yeah, well, um, I wanted to shift gears a bit, you know, like, um, because you talk a lot about like the community work you've done and the art that you've done. Mm -hmm. But um, but I want to talk about an underappreciated art form, and that's motherhood. So, congratulations (laughs) to you. (laughs) We know that you recently became the mom of a beautiful baby boy. And so, Mm -hmm. like, um, how has being a parent changed the way you create? Mm. Well, (laughs) <laughs> I feel like um, I'm in the, I'm still at the beginning stages, you know, he's only two and a half. So I feel like um, every day is different. I mean, I, that probably is the same with you all, right? I mean, I don't know, you have it almost a teenager. So maybe it's, I don't know, maybe I don't know what it's like. Yeah. Um, but uh, every day is different. So I guess what it, what is, it has helped me is, is, is think about flexibility. Mm -hmm. Like you just have to stay flexible. You have to stay adaptable, which I think being an an artist teach, you know, you learn that early on, you know, I think, um, you know, I mean, I teach also, and I tell my students like gain a lot of skills, just have a lot of skills because, um, you know, if, if one thing, you know, everything is at a different pace. So maybe, um, 
making objects is on a slower pace at that moment. Well, then pick up on the research or, or, or you know, work on this other thing, right? Um, that, that staying kind of adaptable is important. It's almost like a survival skill. And I feel like that's the same for parenting so far. <laughs> um, it's just, yeah. And also kind of like uh, trying to laugh more. <laughs> you know, uh, my husband is also in the creative field. He he does architecture and he writes about architecture. And so, you know, we're 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 both um, involved in that kind of creative space. Um, and, you know, we're often like reminding ourselves like, OK, we got to like take everything with a grain of salt. You know, we just got to like laugh about this sometimes. Um, and so I think same with art making is, you know, when you're in the studio or when you're out and working with community, um, there is no one way. And also somebody might be having a bad day or a great day or something might just uh, fall through. You have to then sort of figure out another way um, to, to make it happen or maybe just to change gears altogether. It's just not working. So let's try this other thing. Um, so, so that has really helped me kind of think about that. I also feel like, um, it's helped me. I've been thinking so much about intimacy. You know, I mentioned that before. Um, and I think it has something to do with COVID parent, being a young parent, mostly during a COVID time. Mm -hmm. um, and thinking about the value of, of, of closeness, of touch. Mm -hmm. um, and I think about touch a lot in relationship to to space and to community and to the wall and to people, um, being able to hold each other, you know, um, what it means to, to touch a wall and to change it maybe, or to think you can change it maybe, or to put it out there into the universe. Mm -hmm. um, and to, to just to, to hold my child, you know, and to, to think about that. Um, I know you, I know you all were just talking about how one of your kids doesn't, <laughs> doesn't want to be yeah. oh no they want to they want to be helped no they yeah. want to be she, right, she right, right. Always, so, like if you're if you're not with her yeah if, she, I, she sits next to me at the dinner table and while i'm eating she like if she's finished with her she will hook my arm yeah. so it's really hard for me to eat because she's oh my god <laughs> yeah she loves that is so it. sweet she's like kind of close to her she she walks over to you and she constantly has a she has to touch you. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I want to. I want to talk to her. I bet she's got some great insights. Um, yeah. Yeah. My son is a little bit more like. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but okay, I'm done. You know, it's, it's sort of like that. So, but it's also yeah, personal space boundaries. I get it. You know, it's it's good. Um, yeah. So those, yeah, I would say those are you know a couple of things um, that I've been thinking a lot about right now in this time and and how parenting and being an artist. And um, and I'm I'm also like I don't you know some I you know I, I teach at an art school and one doesn't see it, it's you know the the artistic field hides and erases um, parents but it, especially mothers you know they're just sort of mm. I mean, partly because it's it's not supportive of of artist mothers I think mm. um, but also because um, I mean, I see it with students, like I've been trying to normalize it as much as possible. So so during my classes, which I was teaching mostly online, I was like, hey, look, who's here? <laughs> you know, here's my my child or let me, you know, you might you might hear my toddler, you know, that it's just trying to normalize. It. And I guess we didn't have a choice. You know, it was everything was sort of merging together. Yeah. Um, but in some ways, I feel like in the past I was able or maybe one was able to almost sort of separate mm -hmm. one's professional life with one's parenting life mm -hmm. and i think covid and and all of this just you know everything is it's like the whole package and i i, I think that's important to hold on to that it that we shouldn't hide things away we shouldn't be ashamed um because i think that the field um uh does sort of uh make you feel shame about it and um and that's wrong right yeah i uh, 100 percent um agree we uh, we're artist partners um, in the area where we're based and um, with um, an organization. And one of the conversations we recently had, because we were talking about artist housing um, mm -hmm. and how when you talk about artist housing, they're studio apartments, right? 
And and I was just talking about like, you know, how long are we going to wait before we introduce like family artist housing? You know, right. Because there yes. are just like you and your husband are both creatives, right? right? And you yeah. want to have a family. So why does like, you know, artists yeah. who are together and planning to build a family, why can't they live in those communities? Mm-hmm. Why can't they yes. also yeah. be a part of that? And so, um, yeah, you know, yeah. especially if we're serious about creating these spaces in our communities, but also trying mm-hmm. to make sure that people feel like they can stay in yeah. these communities mm-hmm. and start mm-hmm. their family. You know? Yeah, 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 absolutely. And I think I love that that for sure. I think they're thinking of the studio apartment. I mean, that's a particular image we have of the artist. That's the, the solo artist that's working by themselves all day. And that's not there's so many ways of being an artist. And I mean the, I've also been interested in artist residencies who are family friendly, you know, and I, I, I don't know that many, there's some, um, you know, uh, I didn't have my son at the, I think I was pregnant at the time, but I was at a, at a residency in Florida and that one, you know, I think like one time a year or something, the artists with children could actually, you know, bring their entire family and even have, you know, daycare, which yeah. is like, holy cow, that would be amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the the Rauschenberg residency, mm-hmm. um, they would provide childcare too, and, and it's like that's amazing. Like we should be thinking about that the whole person yeah. if we really want them to be sustainable, right? Yeah. To keep doing that work. Absolutely, so, yeah. absolutely. I, I just want to point out, you know, to anyone listening, if uh, if this becomes a thing within the next few years, you heard it here you first. I'm <laughs> sure to credit us, uh, Maria, you know, for for making this happen. You are welcome. You are welcome. You are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I 100% agree. I mean, we, we talk about that being very much involved in the artist community. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, we talk about affordability and what does affordability look like mm-hmm. and um, mm-hmm. and maintaining, you know, the culture. Because, you know, mm-hmm. a, a lot of cities across the country are going through gentrification and rezoning and like that. And mm-hmm. you know, we talk about artists and the importance of artists when it's convenient, when it, you know, mm-hmm. we can get the money mm-hmm. and write some mm-hmm. particular oh, project. Yeah. And so yeah. not with maintaining, I mean, how we look at income mm-hmm. and on and on, but it's like, yeah. yeah, you know, when we think about, yes, you're a working artist, you're generating income, but it may not mm-hmm. be, you know, it's not month to month. It's not a, a paycheck right. for every two weeks type of thing. Yeah. Right. Right. A lot of conversations to, um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, yeah. Yeah. When we talk about, um, for instance, in, in your past with your past exhibition, mm-hmm. like Brown Brilliance, um, Darkness Matter that you had, where you look at historical narratives and cultural mm-hmm. heritage. This past year, okay, or heck, within the last six months, so we've had the election of 2020, we've had the January 6th insurrection, we've had the pandemic, we've had, you know, um, violence in the streets, we've had protests, um, history being made, as well as people challenging mm-hmm. history. Um, what do you think is the role of the artists or art activists today during oh, this time? Artivists. Or artivists. Right. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I think, um, and, and other brilliant artists have, have said this before me, um, but I think that, um, uh, I think being relevant, mm-hmm. you know, and of course relevant is subjective, relevant to whom, of course. Um, but I think that uh, uh, being, you know, being being critical is is I think one of the greatest assets of being an artist. You know that most of the artists that I've always looked up to or consider to be uh, mentors or, or people that I I seek information from are people that are lending a critical eye to something. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I think that folks like Nina Simone or, or you know, other artists have talked about artists being, uh, you know, they're bearing witness to the world around them, and that is really important. Um, and and what it means to be translating these 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 traumas and um, uh, challenges in this time means being bold and, but also being um, nuanced you know that that to be complex that it's not i mean i've, I've been mostly interested in you know what does it mean to translate this moment to transcribe it 
through through visual art or, th or through other forms of art um, that represent not a generic picture, but something that um, is really layered and uh, meaningful and that maybe we don't necessarily have a resolve, but that is pointing to redirecting our our assumptions about something. Mm -hmm. and, that, and I think that that's really important. At least that's, that's important for me to do. Um, and I also try to teach that to my students um, because, you know, it's easy, it's, it's easy for one to be enamored by this um, romantic notion of being an artist. Like, you know, the sort of traditional romantic notion of being an artist is uh, producing work, getting a gallery, um, making art that sells, um, uh, you know, all, you know, and, and it's nothing wrong with that, right? <laughs> I mean, of course, we also need to make income and all of that, but I think it shouldn't necessarily be like the focus, right? Um, it's about me making work that is meaningful um, and and that you can sustain it. But, you know, it's not, sometimes the work that we make might be like difficult, you know, and, and maybe it's not beautiful. Yeah. Maybe, I mean, that's, that's difficult because it's like, well, isn't it about beauty, right? Um, but maybe sometimes, I mean, what does beauty mean? You know, like how do we then unpack beauty? Because my beauty might be different from your beauty. And so, you know, that, so I guess what I'm saying is that there is no one way, you know, and, um, and, and I, you know, because I teach at an art school, I think a lot about how do I teach a kind of multi multiplicity of perspectives so that students don't walk away with this like one idea of what it should look like and be like and smell like and sound like you know that it that, that it, there are many options um there are many ways of being and that also you can change you know like you might be doing this one thing for a while and then you like you know you're doing something else that's okay you know we don't have to be um tied to this one thing that we can grow and change and that's part of that I think that's it's that's part of what it means to evolve or like um uh what is that um grace uh grace lee boggs in detroit says that beautiful thing like revolution is about evolution mm -hmm. and um and i love that you know like really emphasis on evolution yeah. and um and i i think that's you know maybe that's the other piece too is to kind of see yourself within an evolutionist perspective, because like you said, um, histories are being erased. Uh, racism is somehow didn't happen. <laughs> it's not happening. That's, that's what the conservatives are, are saying, basically. Nobody wants to talk about, they don't want to talk about slavery. They don't want to talk about critical race theory. Um, and they don't want to change. They don't want to evolve. They want things to stay the same. So it's almost like, I think maybe, maybe, being an artist who who is also an activist who cares about activism, um, maybe what we need to also focus on is 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 what it means to evolve to evolve individually as a person, but also evolve as a community and to let ourselves do that. And maybe that is the most radical thing we can do right now because everything is about being stagnant. Um, the powers that be want things to stay the same, which is not good. <laughs> yeah. So. As you reflect on your career, what would you say has been maybe like your biggest lesson? Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, so many. Which one do I pick? I mean, um, biggest lesson. Okay. Uh, I didn't prepare for that. I mean, I didn't prepare for any question, but <laughs> oh, I knew maybe some of them would come. Um, biggest lesson. Um, I guess uh, one of them would be um, kind of what I said about parenting, which is, you know, sometimes like the work that I do is uh, very intense, you know? <laughs> um, and I think my students remind me to laugh a little, like uh, I, I, I try to remember clowning or, you know, these like, 
yes, these are difficult things, but like, how do we still um, find a space for a, a humanity that allows for like different kinds of feelings, you know, that it, it's not just about that one experience because obviously we're made up of so many experiences. And um, I think that it's trying to step back, I've, I've needed to sort of step back and like, let me look at the bigger picture here. And um, how do I nurture or how in my, my art practice, my teaching, my, my um, community based art practice, how do I kind of nurture these, these different ways of being um, uh, because I don't want to be prescriptive, you know, I don't want to be um, uh, telling people what to make, you know, that, that it, it's about kind of creating a space that feels nurturing and it can be meaningful and transformative to people. Um, and sometimes that looks like, you know, workshopping different ideas or creating a space where we can like, you know, become experimental or make a space for experimentation. Um, so th I think that is one of the greatest lessons. It feels like a life lesson, I think, in many ways. Um, you know, and uh, and slowness. Yeah, mm -hmm. just take just take it slow. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I mean, that's why I love the intro that that the music that you have. I assume you made you made you all made it. Yeah, yeah. you made it. <laughs> Oh, yes. It has like this ease, you know, um, it has this ease and this, this slowness that um, I also kind of want to think more about or reproduce, you know, it, especially in this time where everything's like fast, fast, fast production, production, mm -hmm. um, uh, consumption. Mm -hmm. I, I think also about slowing things down and uh, taking the time to re and not having an answer really quickly, you know, that it's like, well, maybe I need some time for that, actually. Might take two weeks <laughs> or more. <laughs> you know, but then that's, you know, in some cases that won't work, but in some, in many cases, it's actually okay, you know? So, yeah. Yeah, well, that's great. You know, um, we're about to wrap up, but I wanted to mm -hmm. um, reflect on, you know, as, as you are an artist, as you mentioned, an activist, an educator, if you had to choose just one of those <laughs> mm -hmm. for the rest of your life, which one would you choose? No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I, artist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, artist. I think that, um, yeah, I mean, I don't, yes, you're right. I don't think we have to make a, a, a choice and of course, but um, to me that that is my home. That is my home because, I mean, also sometimes, you know, to be honest, um, I know activists who put their bodies on the line mm -hmm. in ways that I don't do it in that same way, you know? Um, uh, and so I sometimes take a step back from them because I think, you know, they're really doing um, uh, this work that is, um, yeah, that it that that it is at a different level, you know. In some ways, um, the risk is greater. The right. risk is greater. So I I like to res, you know respect that and understand that, and I'm okay with that. You know, I've I, I've not always been okay. I, I've struggled with that actually quite a bit, but I'm I'm okay with that. I I know that there's a certain certain kind of thing that I do that, and I want to flourish in that. And if I can participate if I can participate or contribute to those conversations, that, that is, that is wonderful. And, but I do think that uh, the way I define an artist is, is, is somebody that is going against the grain. So in some ways, maybe it's, it's not necessarily activism. Um, but, but I think it is, um, you know, it, it is about a kind of taking action, um, working against some kind of system of power in many ways. And, um, and that, that's exciting to me, you know, and I, and I, and I think that everybody can do their part, you know, like even if you're, um, I don't know, what is the opposite of being an artist? I don't know, being a financial manager. I don't know. <laughs> There's probably some artists out there that are like, I'm a financial manager. Yeah. Right. There's an what are you talking about? Right. Yeah. 
I'm my own financial manager, right? Being an artist is also just doing your own bookkeeping. And so, yeah, um, I'm making a generalization maybe, but you know, I think uh, everybody can kind of play a role in that, right? Everybody can, can um, work for change in, in, in whatever field that they're in. Well, I'm excited. I'm excited to see, you know, because one thing about, unfortunately, one thing about trauma and hard times and challenging times, it does make for great art. And yes. so mm-hmm. I'm very mm-hmm. um, inspired and, and look forward to seeing, you know, in the next year or so, what people have been doing while they've been mm-hmm. in ho- at home or in the studio or, or in the streets. Or in the right. streets. Right. Right, right. So that's yeah. that's gonna be because there's a lot of content. Yeah. <laughs> Lots yeah. of work to work with. There's yeah. plenty to work with. And so I'm excited to see what you and mm-hmm. other other artists are doing and developing and what we, you know, um mm-hmm. come Every, up with. Yeah, stuff. everybody's cooking. Everybody's cooking, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um Please let us know what I know we mentioned earlier that you recently re- are a recipient of the United States Art this mm. fellowship. What yeah. other things um, that you have in store? What's going on? What's on your calendar? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, well, yeah, that that was a, a an incredible honor, you know, I, for for other artists out there that are, you know, sending in applications all the time, as as I am too. Um, you know, that was not my first try. So <laughs> several applications later. Um, so, but it, you know, it's an incredible honor to be part of that community and the work that they're doing is, is really amazing. Um, but I am, so I'm right now I'm working on a couple of things. Um, I am recording the demolition of, of the division one, uh, portion of the Cook County jail. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about, uh, uh, you know, the word abolition and how abolition shows up through material. Mm-hmm. And um, it, it was very much inspired by the work of um, uh, some folks um, over at UC Santa Cruz who, who did a series of, um, of conversations, um, Gina Dent, um, mm-hmm. Angela Davis, uh, 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 Rachel Nelson, um, and others who organized a series of conversations called Visualizing Abolition. Mm-hmm. And it was, wow, it was amazing. And it was like bringing scholars and artists together to talk about like, what does it look like visually? And so I've been thinking so much about that through, but not through material, because, you know, I was talking about touch. I want to go back to, to things that I can touch or I can hold. Um, so I'm thinking about how abolition shows up through something I can hold yeah. um, and how the, 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 the demolition of the jail is something that is disassembling, that is getting deconstructed, that is disappearing. Um, of course, what that's working towards is, is the question mark um, because as we know, um, jails and jails are also, you know, putting more people on electronic monitoring, yeah. um, you know, so, 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 so we'll see it's to be determined, but, um, but because of uh, recent, you know, uh, uh, laws, um, cash bail has now been, you know, ruled out here and many other s- uh, states. So there are uh, people um, leaving, right? The, the, some of the jails, and so, so there's less people there since when I started. When I started doing the work, there were about thirteen thousand people. Now there's about half of that, though the numbers may have gone up during the pandemic. Um, so, you know, so anyway, I'm recording that and, um, I'm working with some of the, uh, people that were in my project inside of the jail who've since now been released and who've stayed out since then and people who I've stayed in touch with and they want to continue making art together. So we're developing a project right now. It's right now it, it's, it looks like performance for video and it'll be in tandem with the, the deconstruction of the jail. So. Uh, and thinking about disappearance and opacity and, and um, um, you know, abolition. So, and I'm excited to think about, like I've been looking at um, modern dance, um, artists working in theater, but sort of in this sort of, uh, you know, in between state between art and theater, mm-hmm. um, theater and dance. Um, and I've also just been really interested in the work of experimental filmmakers. So. My good friend Christopher Harris, um, 
you know, did a beautiful piece um, called Still Here about St. Louis and um, uh, the the kind of um, vacancy of that city, you know, and he recorded it. Um, um, and, and just other examples of people doing amazing work with the camera. And so I'm excited to think about this this medium that that is slightly newer for me. You know, I've been working more like hands-on, big production, but I kind of want to work more intimately, smaller scale with less people to make something, you know, just as powerful, I hope. So this will be probably the next year and, and a half or so. So I'll, I'll keep you yeah, attuned. Too. <laughs> love to look forward to see what you do next. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. Well, this, Yo, has been, thank you. this has been wonderful. Thank yeah. you so, so, so much for taking your time you. and yeah. catching up with you and <laughs> all that you've been doing. Of course, we follow you on Instagram and, and your social media. And I'm so, still rooting for you. Yeah. Yes. So, you do great work. Mm -hmm. um, we are so, like we said, looking forward to seeing what you do next. So, Absolutely. thank you. Thank but, Thank you, thank you so much for um, creating this platform and for all the opportunities you're giving to artists to also just be in communication with one another and to talk about things that, you know, we don't always have the chance to share, you know. Um, everybody's also so busy, so this is such a great platform to be able to share information and one story. So thank you for everything you do, and I'm so glad that we've stayed in touch all these years. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is a joy. This is our, our baby out mm -hmm. of the pandemic, um, mm -hmm. you, you know, as our T-shirt, my T-shirt says. Yeah, like, I love it. <laughs> and it's just, um, you know, it's just, you know, it was a great way for us to just catch up with mm -hmm. those who physically couldn't see them. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny how we went to school together, you know, we see people, we hang out, but we don't necessarily know their creative journey and their story. And so mm -hmm. we have this platform to use that to learn more about, you know, our folks. Yeah. You know, we it's we say all the time, we know, oh, well, yeah, I know that person, but we don't, how much do we really know? Yeah. And, yeah. And a lot of times folks only really get to see the destination and not the journey. So like mm -hmm. it allows like folks to really kind of show them how they got mm -hmm. from one point to another. Um, and as they keep finding new destinations along the path. Right. So like, you know, we appreciate folks like you who make the time and, and hopefully, you know, the people listening find some inspiration in, in your story. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Sending you a big virtual hug. Yes, yes. <laughs> we receive that. It. Yes, so hold tight. We're gonna close out the show. But for those of you again, okay. if you enjoyed this this episode, please make sure to like and share and the you know. Make sure you subscribe as make well. Sure you subscribe below. Yeah, because more interviews are coming, and uh, and of course we we can't leave without plugging the fact that um, we did release a children's book. Uh, called She Sees that's available now. So for those of you who have little ones or have little ones in the family, someone else's kids that you get to give back, um, <laughs> feel free to check out the book. Um, it's uh, a labor of love that was uh, written by me, edited by Rochelle and illustrated by Mira, uh, Miera Little Bunny Nelson. So um, that is available now. But on that note, we got to get out of here. And Maria, once again, thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you to everyone. Thank for you, everybody. Time. All right, All right. Peace. peace, peace. Bye. Thanks for listening to Artistry, where art meets industry. This podcast has been brought to you by Substantial Art Music. For more information, please visit www.subartmusic.com. You can also follow us on social media at Subart Music. We'll see you soon. We'll talk to you soon. Peace.